Okay, morning everybody. Good morning. I can see there's some sle- sleepy heads today, but uh, mainly me. But <laughs> um, so, but the weekend is near. So let us uh, begin by just reminding you uh, that last time. We showed that the most general spherically symmetric the let's call them the source free. So that was a, a very powerful result. That spherically symmetry, spherical symmetry implies the metric must be static uh, if there is no stress energy. Uh, and, um, and this is its form. So uh, obviously all that remains is to fix the constant k. And to fix the constant k, <laughs> We'll look at uh, large R, in which case uh, the metric uh, uh, G mu nu becomes approximately flat space, right? Because the 1 over R corrections are small, plus H mu nu. And this H mu nu is of order uh, um, K over R. And we know what uh, the solution represents in that limit that, uh, so recall that H naught naught is equal to minus 2 phi over C squared in this, uh, in the weak field limit, we can identify the zero, zero perturbation of the metric with the Newtonian gravitational potential. And uh, so now all we have to think about is what does a Newtonian gravitational potential, which goes like constant over R, represent? And uh, recall that phi equals minus gm over R um, is the Newtonian potential uh, outside a mass spherical mass mass m. Okay, so this immediately tells us that K, uh, that H naught naught, which is minus K over R at large R, is equal to um, um, 2 GM 
over c squared. And so we can, the Schwarzschild metric represents the uh, uh, exterior of a spherical mass. And uh, it can just be written in, in that form. Okay, so we've identified what this integration constant means. It means the, uh, the mass of the object. And in fact, in general relativity, uh, this is more or less the definition of the mass of an object. Uh, because in general relativity, the energy in the gravitational field gets tangled up with the energy of the mass of the source. You have these uh, field equations, T mu nu. And um, this, this, <laughs> oh no, oh, that looks bad. <laughs> Switch it off. <laughs> Switch it off. Don't electrocute yourself. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> testing if the water is uh, <laughs> testing the water. Hello. Here. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you, thanks. Um, yes. Yeah, so that so in the Einstein equations, you see this T mu nu depends on the metric. In general. So it's, it's very hard to separate what is gravity, what is matter. And in fact, this Einstein tensor is nonlinear. So it, uh, it includes the metric as well. And some of those metric fluctuations would be interpreted in general as gravitational waves, which have energy. So everything is tangled up in the Einstein equations. And it's very difficult to say what has the energy and what doesn't. And in fact, the only situations where the energy uh, in general, is well defined is when you go off to infinity and space is nearly flat at infinity, and you say, okay, what's the disturbance in the metric at infinity? And that, this is a kind of uh, simplest example of that, but this is a very general procedure. And um, uh, so this turns out to be the definition. In fact, this leads to the definition of the mass of an object. A body in general relativity. So uh, obviously the Schwarzschild metric is much more interesting than our uh, very crude, very simple Newtonian arguments leading to, to the H naught naught because it's exact and it holds everywhere, it holds for all R. So the only assumption is if I've got my spherical body, then uh, and if R is outside that body, okay, then the Schwarzschild holds here. Okay, so it's valid at any radius outside the body. It's not valid inside the body because there's a T mu nu, which I've ignored. Okay, but it's valid for all radii outside. Uh, just the same as in Newton, Newtonian's theory, you, Newton's theory. You can figure out what phi is outside 
a spherical body by using um, by using the divergence theorem uh, without um, without uh, solving the equations inside uh, the body. So um, uh, obviously, what is what is tempting? So bearing this in mind that this is only valid outside the body. When you look at that metric, something very striking happens. You know, what's the disaster in that metric? <laughs> As I take R, it's two yeah, the 2M, yeah, what happens to the dt squared term? dt squared term goes to zero. Okay, so that's very strange. It looks like the, the metric, uh, it appears, so provided the mass, mass, uh, M is always inside R, right? It looks like uh, the metric becomes singular, singular at R equals 2 GM, GM over C squared. And this is called the Schwarzschild radius. Rs, the okay. So, in particular, if you imagine some body has collapsed under gravity to some very small size, then this uh, Schwarzschild radius might end up being um, outside the body. Okay, so that would be Rs, and then you're in big trouble because the metric is singular. Remember, a fundamental tenet of GR is the metric's got to be invertible. It's got to have uh, one negative and four and three positive eigenvalues, and that's not what's happening here. This has one zero eigenvalue and one infinite eigenvalue, okay, and that's uh, quite bad. But uh, it turns out, we shall see, that this is a coordinate artifact. This is a coordinate singularity. And there exists coordinates which, which, in which G is not singular. G mean U is not singular at Rs. Okay, nevertheless, when Schwarzschild discovered this, and for the subsequent approximately 40 years, people assumed there's some disaster at RS. And then for the next uh, 50 years, they persuaded themselves there wasn't a disaster at RS. <laughs> and then for the last uh, five years, uh, people have convinced themselves, some people, that there is a disaster at RS. So it's gone backwards and forwards, and the short answer is that nobody knows if there is or isn't a disaster at RS. So, what? It's sinusoidal. Um, but, um, okay, so, but there's a very big, you can see immediately, there's a huge physical effect. <coughs> physical effect at RS. R equals Rs. Remember I gave you a very simple discussion of gravitational time dilation, right? So the idea was, recall, I've got a clock sitting in my gravitational field, and it measures a proper time interval delta tau. And then I say, um, so, uh, so the idea is that this clock is going to be sitting at some fixed R. And in particular, I'm going to put it at R equals Rs. Using a rocket or something, I'm just going to stick my clock at this radius. Of course, there is a gravitational for force on it, so it would tend to fall in, inwards. But uh, I'm going to hold it there, or at R, as near to Rs as I can. Um, and if I hold it there, um, so this is gravitational time dilation. Uh, 
I know what the ticks of the clocks are in the rest frame of the clock, uh, in, a, in, a local, uh, in the local frame of the clock. And so that, uh, but that, but I also know what this is in any coordinate system. So this is g naught naught to the one half uh, delta t. Okay, because delta, if it's not moving in delta r, the dr is zero, and this is the proper time. And so we inferred from that that the time between the ticks of the clock, as inferred by somebody using this time as the time, this t as the time, and that somebody is somebody at infinity. Okay, because somebody at infinity, the one of our terms have gone away, and their proper time is dt. Okay, so it tells you that dt is delta tau. This is the value of the clock that the manufacturers made it with times one-half. And, of course, this is equal to delta tau over the square root of 1 minus gm, 2gm over rc, uh, over rc squared. And this goes to, to infinity as r is taken to, as r uh, decreases to rs. So if I kind of hold a clock on a rope and lower it into the black hole, and it sits on the, it sits very close to the horizon, as it approaches the horizon, it's the time I will see between its sticks is going to go to infinity. Uh, another way of saying it, maybe more dramatically, if you watch an astronaut falling into a black hole, as they fall towards the short shell radius, what you're going to see is the wavelength of radiation coming off the re astronaut becoming redder. Okay? The, wave, the, period, the frequency of the wavelength goes down because the ticks of the clock are getting further and further apart. And so the, the astronaut becomes redder and redder and just sort of splats on the horizon, or very slowly, and freezes there, <laughs> going all the while going redder and redder and redder. So they emit longer and longer wavelength radiation, and eventually you won't see them anymore because the wavelength is so long that you can't detect it. So, uh, so that's what the prediction is, that if an object has collapsed inside its Schwarzschild radius, you would see an infinite gravitational redshift of radiation emitted from near, uh, from uh, from that surface. Yeah. Can you derive this effect using other coordinates for the metric? Yes. So yes. this is valid in coordinate, the board. coordinate independent. This is co this quantity is coordinate independent. Okay. So when I write this down in some other coordinates, all I have to do is write down this g mu nu dx mu dx nu, the half. That's coordinate independent. So I'll write it down, and then I will have to decide, you know, what these coordinates represent, whose time is it, and then whoever's time it is, I will have a formula for um, the relationship. And, and it's also valid if somebody's moving, you see. So if somebody's moving and you know their velocity, you would use that to figure out what the dr should be in this formula, because their velocity will then come in. So it's a completely general formula. Um, so let's put some numbers in, because uh, this is fun. And uh, in, in fact, a big reason for my leaving, you know, my leaving C in and G in, lots of books said G equal to 1 and C equals 1. But it's very nice not to do that, even though it's kind of dumb to leave in the units. Uh, the reason is that when you look at a formula, you can sort of immediately take certain limits of it. You can imagine, what happens if the speed of light goes to infinity? What happens if Newton's constant is small, or if it's huge? And uh, the, the, those things are sort of immediately obvious. So, you know, roughly speaking, why is that number, uh, why is the Schwarzschild radius uh, small? You know, roughly speaking, uh, the Schwarzschild radius is 2 gm over r c squared. Well, it's small because c is large. c is a big number. Speed of light is big. 
And that's why the Schwarzschild radius is, is, uh, is small. And, and so on. So, however you do it, it's very useful to, to actually restore the units. And it's a sort of conceptual aid to thinking about things. Now, uh, for the sun, if we work this out, we get 2 times so, uh, Newton's constant is 6.7 times 10 to the minus 11. The solar mass is 10, 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. And then the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And so this turns out to be 3 kilometers. So if the sun collapsed tomorrow and became smaller than 3 kilometers in radius, uh, it would have fallen inside at short shot radius. Okay, that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, that's not going to happen to the sun because the sun will first uh, explode uh, in uh, become a, a red giant and it's going to engulf the earth. But that won't be for about two billion years, so we're, all, we're, we're safe for the moment. But that'll be global warming with a, with a, with a vengeance. Okay shouldn't make jokes about those things. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. So the, uh, what about the Milky Way? Uh, so, so uh, obviously, 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 uh, the radius of the sun is greater than radius uh, Schwarzschild. And the sun is not a black hole. However, there is a black hole. In uh, the center of our galaxy. And uh, have you seen the movie of the black hole? It's not the black hole. It's of the stars around the black hole in the center of the galaxy. Have you seen it? Some of you haven't seen it. So it's worth looking at. Uh, I, I meant to set it up today, but I forgot. Um, it's, uh, it's online. And if you look at um, black hole, uh, Milky Way, and I think use the word S2. I believe it's S2. S2 is the name of the star, which is the most dramatic one in the picture. So it's literally a movie of the position of the stars in the center of our galaxy, uh, taken with a, a, a very powerful telescope. And what you see is these stars orbiting some object you can't see. It's black. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, this is the candidate black hole. And this particular star called S2 uh, is very dramatic. Okay, so really you, so you'll see a bunch of orbits and stars moving along these orbits. They're obviously going around something. But this S2 star sort of uh, comes in like this and then, whoa, <laughs> gets a big uh, speed up as it goes near to this absent object. <laughs> okay. It's really, if you, if you doubt that there's a black hole in the center of a galaxy, you look at that movie. It's pretty spectacular. Yeah? Don't you see, like, um, gravitational lensing or something from stars passing behind it? Uh, yes, yeah, yes, you should. You've got to be pretty lucky because it's small. It's still small. We're going to work right. on its size. So at the moment, we don't have a resolution to see the size. I, I'm just coming to that. Okay, so from these orbital dynamics, you infer that the mass is approximately 4 million solar masses. Okay, so it's, it's called a supermassive black hole. And uh, the Schwarzschild radius is obviously 4 million times that number. So the Schwarzschild radius is approximately uh, 10 to the 10 meters. Okay, or 10 million kilometers. So it's quite big, 
but it's a very long way away. Okay, the distance is approximately 2 times 10 to the 20 meters. Okay, the center of the galaxy, we're, we're, uh, we're thousands of light years from the center of the galaxy. And uh, this is the distance. So you can figure out the angle. It subtends, um, which is uh, roughly uh, 10 to the minus 10 radians. Right? Uh, 2 pi radians is 360 degrees. This is uh, 10 to the minus 10 radians. So it's a tiny, 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 tiny object on the sky. Okay, this is why we can't yet watch things behind it. Nevertheless, uh, technology is getting pretty powerful. Okay? And so there's something called very long baseline interferometry, which is basically using all the radio telescopes on the planet as a big, or many of them, as a big interferometer. Okay, so this is something which uh, Avery Broderick, who's here, is one of the leaders. So you have all these radio telescopes, and they're looking at this tiny, tiny object. And uh, you know for uh, any optical device that the resolution, the resolution is uh, approximately um, the wavelength of the radiation divided by the length of the baseline. Okay? So, um, the biggest baseline you can get uh, at currently, uh, we have to go to the moon to make a bigger one, but the biggest baseline you can get is the diameter of the Earth, the um, a sort of reasonable wavelength, though it's pushing technology, is about a millimeter. This would be uh, hundreds of gigahertz, so radio telescopes typically operate at gigahertz, uh, uh, which corresponds to meters uh, wavelengths, but uh, about a hundred, uh, or rather 10 centimeters. But if you go to 100 gigahertz, you get down to millimeter. And uh, the size of the planet, of course, is 6,000, uh, uh, um, six, the radius is 6,000 kilometers. So let's say with the diameter, that's 10 to the 7 uh, meters. Okay, this is gigahertz, 100 gigahertz radiation. Uh, waves, uh, radio waves. This is the uh, diameter of the Earth. And that's almost at 10 to minus 10. <laughs> okay. And that's, so it's pushing the limits. You've got to go to the shortest radiation that's pretty much feasible. And you've got to go to the biggest telescope you can imagine. And then you might be able to see the black hole. Yeah. What's the size of a star by comparison? Uh, what's an average star? Depends like, how near it is. Yeah, but I'm sorry, like the stars, <laughs> the stars say like it's rotated going around the black hole. Oh, they're smaller. They're smaller than the black hole. Uh, wait, sorry, no, no, I'm wrong. Uh, well, what's the radius of the sun? Just compare it to the short child radius to the radius of the sun. What's the radius of the sun? <laughs> Uh, I don't remember. Um, this is not very big. Uh, uh, ten, uh, ten, um, 10 million kilometers. I don't know what's that compared to the sun. I think the sun is much bigger than that. Um, the sun is only 695,000 kilometers. The sun? 695,500. The radius? The solar radius. Say again? 695,500. Okay, 695,000 <coughs> kilometers. Kilometers. Yeah. Okay. No, it's like 100 Earths across. So let's call that a million, so 10 to the 9 meters. Okay, so it's a bit bigger than the sun. 10 times bigger. So, yeah, in principle, you could see the stars going behind it. Um, you have to be lucky. 
Um, I don't remember what the distance of closest approach here is, but I think it's substantially bigger. So, of course, that picture doesn't really prove anything because the star is going quite a long way away from the black hole, and it's not proving that the black hole is inside its short shell radius. This kind of measurement hopefully will prove it. And uh, they are predicting that within a few years, within five years, ten years, they will actually see a picture of the... Um, black hole in the center with a uh, dark uh, disk. Oh, wow. Okay. So, no, it's close. This is, this is close. Close to being, being observed. You got to just convince NASA, NASA to go to the telescope on the moon, then, right? Yes. <laughs> That's the next step. <laughs> so, yeah, for some reason, the universe is designed to be understood. We, we don't know why. <laughs> okay. I always think of it as the universe is teaching us step by step. You know, it dangles a little carrot in front of us, and we have to, to rise to the challenge, and then uh, we learn more. Excuse me? Yep. Is the only possible way we can we see a black hole grow just you know, space rubbish piling up at the event horizon? It doesn't pile up. Just... Well, Seen from it outside. falls through. From outside, yeah. we see it fall in and going red and just uh, going to longer so and longer wavelengths. We'll never see black holes grow by growing thicker on the event horizon. We'll never actually see anything no. pop inside. No. no. It's impossible for us to see. Um, uh, w when we study the space time in the black hole, that'll become obvious. It, 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 this R equals RS is what's called a horizon. And horizon, by definition, is a region beyond which uh, nothing, light cannot escape to an observer in infinity. So uh, as soon as somebody's gone into the horizon, you can't see anything. Okay, so since, since I've mentioned uh, an experiment, let me just uh, uh, list some of the most... Uh, yeah? Talk about how the time, like the dilation of the time, goes to infinity as yes, the, uh, as you fall into, the, as you lower something onto the black hole. You can forever stay at the horizon. Yeah, the from the outside point of view, that's what you know. As you see someone falling in, your impression would be they're stuck there. Though you uh, won't see them vanish, but you won't see them vanish. You 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 will see their wavelength, their color, going redder and redder and redder. Okay. How they actually fall? You have to do it yourself. <laughs> you have to fall with them. You can film them, <laughs> but you'd be falling in too. And uh, yeah, when you fall in, uh, I believe we may do this. I, I, if we have time, we'll do it. Actually, it's pretty obvious. When you fall in, how long is it going to take you to hit? The, there's a singularity in the middle of the black hole. And how long will it take you to hit the singularity if you fall in radially? Right? It's just three kilometers divided by the speed of light. So 10 to the minus 5 seconds for that one. So if I fell into this one, I divide by 3 times 10 to the 8. So 10 to the 10 over 3 times 10 to the 8 would give me uh, 30 seconds. So if you fell into the black hole in the center of our galaxy, you would actually, it would be 30 seconds before you hit the singularity. Is there any way of mathematically seeing that we'd actually fall in? Yes. You use different coordinates. There is. We're, we're going to do the space-time diagram. And you'll discover there's strange things. I mean, you might anticipate it. You look at Schwarzschild metric. Imagine R is less than RS. The first term changes sign. So the dt squared is now, the coefficient is positive. So time is not time. T is not time anymore. When you're inside the black hole, R is the time. <laughs> the second term is negative, minus dr squared. Okay? So what it tells you is that radius is time. And what, it's, what the, that will mean is you have no option but to go forward in time. And going forward in time means decreasing in radius. 
So you have a maximum time of uh, whatever it was, 30, sec 30 seconds. And there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop yourself hitting the single arrow. Yeah. When we do like comparisons with the uh, objects like the sun, we know what it has a radius. How do we know that this Schwarzschild coordinates T and R really can correspond to like the radius we have here? Um, I mean, it could be another obstacle. Oh, I see. Why do you say why? So I had to. I did lots of coordinate transformations. Yeah. You have to keep in mind that the coordinates don't matter. Okay. Uh, describing the sun, I can describe it in any coordinates. It's just a matter of convenience. What I've proved. So the concepts I've used are independent of coordinates. In particular, spherical symmetry, but, uh, independent of like coordinates. The radius of the sun is obviously coordinate dependent. No, it's not. It's a physical radius. The radius of the sun is defined by the physical size of the atoms making up the sun. You know, these atoms are physical objects. Their size is coordinate independent. Nothing physical is dependent on coordinates. That's the basic principle in general relativity. You write down the equations in such a way that they're valid in any coordinates. Then you say, well, what's the size of an atom? <laughs> size of an atom is determined by non-gravitational physics. So I need to go to some coordinates in which the metric is flat, okay, and that defines, um, then all the physics is just physics independent of gravity, and, and then I give you the size of the atom in those coordinates. Okay, once I know that, then I can go to any coordinates, and that's all I'm doing here. So nothing, if you get an answer that depends on the coordinates you used, it's wrong, okay, you're the coordinates are always a convenience. This is the paradox I mentioned before, that we know what we mean by a sphere or some other geometry, okay? But we can't do mathematics on it without introducing coordinates because all we really know how to do is move numbers around, <laughs> okay? We can't move geometry around on a piece of paper, okay? We can move numbers around. So... Uh, this was uh, Descartes' great insight. You know, we use Cartesian coordinates for space. So Descartes said, you know, geometry is algebra, or can be done using algebra. And he defined Cartesian coordinates for space. And, um, and, and, and this is the legacy of it all. But the coordinates themselves are just a tool. And for any physical object, there are an infinite number of different ways of choosing coordinates. Yeah. yeah but you can always just to make it precise as, as in what why the radius of some compact object is really coordinate independent. We can always use something which is like a scalar, which is like the surface area, root of that divided by root two pi or something like that. Yes. Right? And you will always get that that, that yes. quantity is going to be the same. So I think for, if you have a compact yes, object that is, is, no that the um, yeah, no, uh, I mean, if you, anything physical, so if I've got some object and I want to define uh, its size, I mean, you, you, can, you can say what is, the, what is the, pro, you know, the proper surface area, okay? So we define proper length. Proper length is coordinate independent. Proper surface area you can define in a similar way. And then you can say, you know, in any geometry, I can measure that proper length, and I can just interpret that as 4 pi r squared, where r is the radius of the object. So, um, so in the case of the Schwarzschild geometry, if I pick r equals rs, right, remember one of the conveniences of Schwarzschild is that the angular term is just the normal one. That implies that the area of r equals rs is just 4 pi rs squared. Okay, so the surface area, the proper surface area of a black hole is equal to 4 pi uh, times rs. What did I call it? rs or r short shell? rs squared, which is 4 pi times uh, 2g m over c squared squared. Uh, 
And this is uh, completely coordinate independent. Okay, so this, this is a proper uh, quantity that is coordinate invariant. And people often talk about the area of the horizon of a black hole. It's a very fundamental quantity. In fact, there's a famous uh, result uh, due to Bekenstein, which is that he conjectured that the area of a black hole um, corresponds to its entropy, and it can only ever increase. The total area of uh, black hole horizons can never decrease. And then there are various theorems to this effect, that if you collide two black holes and they form one, and the one settles down to spherical symmetry, that the final area has to always be bigger than the combined area of the two initial black holes. Okay, and again, that's a co it's a completely coordinate invariant uh, statement. Okay, so since I mentioned experiments, let me talk about uh, tests of GR, and uh, then we're we're going to do some uh, one one of them in the in the rest of this lecture. Um, we've already mentioned the equivalence principle, and by the way, there's a very exciting field now. There's lots and lots of. Uh, different experiments going on in GR uh, to, to test uh, GR. So the equivalence principle, and this is the idea that all objects fall um, in the same way in a given metric. Okay, so uh, what people have measured is the difference in acceleration between two objects placed, for example, in the Earth's gravitational field um, um, and uh, that is uh, the uh, state of the art is <laughs> that this acceleration, so two, two different objects, objects uh, falling in the Earth's gravitational field, field experience the same acceleration A up to an error, up to a difference, which uh, people can bound with experiment. And so far, the bound is 10 to the minus 13. This is an experiment by Adelberger at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, the uh, step exper the satellite experiment, so this is the satellite test of the equivalence principle. Uh, which is, uh, uh, propo pro so this is just proposed. It seems to be progressing well. You'll find uh, papers on this on the archive. Uh, there's a review, 1401.4784. Uh, by Overduin at Al. The step satellite would uh, is predicted to give a limit delta A over A of less than about 10 to the minus 18. Okay, so that's what's in prospect. What is the equivalence Sorry? Right. Saying that two different objects are experiencing the same acceleration in Earth's gravitational field, isn't that just Newtonian gravity? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, Newtonian gravity satisfies the equivalence principle. There's no difference between falling in a gravitational field and being accelerated. 
Sorry, sorry, um, still standing still on the ground. No, okay, so this is the sort of most basic aspect of the equivalence principle, which is, if you like, the motivation for Einstein's theory was just to notice that all objects fall the same. So that was the initial motivation. Um, yeah, okay, so there are different versions. This is sometimes called the weak equivalence principle. It's the, the very starting point of GR. There's more to the equivalence principle because it basically says you can choose coordinates in which space-time is flat, and in those coordinates, there's no gravitational uh, field. Um, so, so this is what's coming. It's very exciting. Whenever you increase sensitivity by uh, five orders of magnitude, uh, you might discover something new. And uh, uh, there's no date on this satellite yet, but it seems to be uh, developing well. Um, the second one is uh, gravitational redshift. And so for the sun, uh, sorry, the best, Um, so for uh, the best limit so far comes from Mazars, uh, in uh, which basically emit very precisely defined uh, frequency of radiation. So Mazars in Earth, sorry, on Earth, you compare two Mazars, one on the Earth and in orbit. So basically, you, send a, you put a maser in orbit, and you send radiation down to the Earth, and there's a maser on Earth, and you compare the wavelength of the, of the two masers. And the inference from that is the change in uh, frequency minus the theoretical change in frequency, just the gravitational redshift we uh, talked about, divided by the theoretical frequency. So this is the um, error compared to theory is less than uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 4 currently. And this is uh, an experiment done by Vesso. Um, then we have uh, deflection of light. Which was, uh, I think, the first, uh, one of the first uh, experimental tests of general relativity. And I think it's the tutorial. Homework. It's a homework. Okay, so that's the homework. Uh, that now has an accuracy, the deflection angle of light going around the sun minus the theoretical prediction over the theoretical prediction is uh, less than 3 times 10 to the minus 3. Um, there's another effect called the Shapiro time delay. And what's done here is you have the sun. We have uh, um, a planet. We have the Earth. And we send radio waves which bounce off the planet and come back to Earth. And amazingly, this can be done. And uh, what is predicted by GR is that there is a time delay due to the gravitational effect of the sun. And this is now, um, the precision is quite uh, high. So delta t minus delta t theoretical over delta t theoretical 
is less than 2 times 10 to the minus 5. So that's one of the most precise tests of uh, GR. And then uh, 5, we have, um, we have pulsars. And pulsars are uh, neutron stars, which are spinning very rapidly. And they're like beacons in the sky. So they emit pulses of radio waves. And because they're uh, very compact objects, uh, as I already discussed, this quantity 2gm over rc squared is typically on the surface of the neutron star is typically around 0.1. Uh, you get big effects from GR. Um, and in fact, uh, no, um, one of the most dramatic um, um, tests of GR was the binary pulsar. Uh, I've forgotten its number, but uh, this was observed by Hulse and Taylor. Uh, this is the uh, confirmation of the GR prediction of uh, four gravitational waves. So I think we will discuss this on Monday when you have uh, an object that's moving rapidly and has a large mass in GR, it emits gravitational waves. And these, uh, these gravitational waves carry energy away from the system. And what happens to this binary pulsar, it's uh, two pulsars in orbit, and what happens to it is that due to losing energy, the, uh, the two objects fall towards each other. So their uh, total energy decreases because the uh, kinetic energy goes down, the gravitational energy becomes more and more negative, the gravitational potential energy. And uh, uh, as they emit... Uh, gravitational waves. And what is observed is this, the fact that the period of, these, of the orbit becomes uh, shorter and shorter and shorter as the two guys fall towards each other. And uh, the, the, uh, so the, the one can, using the observed parameters of the system, you can predict exactly how the period should change with time, and it agrees with uh, general relativity. So, agrees with GR to around uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 3. And finally, we have uh, gravitational waves. Uh, direct detection of gra gravitational waves. Um, and for that, the uh, most promising experiment is LIGO. Uh, that's uh, kilometer length interferometers. They have two currently. One is being built in India. Um, I think one might be planned for Australia. Um, and uh, the claim is that within five or so years, we should be able to see gravitational waves emitted from the merger of uh, black holes somewhere in the universe. And so that's, that's all uh, very exciting. Um, and then the last one I'm going to talk about is uh, one of, it was actually the first uh, experimental indication in favor of GR, um, and I'll try and do that uh, uh, now. So, 1915, um, Schwarzschild, sorry, 1916, Schwarzschild wrote down this metric, and uh, Einstein realized uh, that 
uh, it gave a, a, a very interesting prediction for the uh, perihelion shift of Mercury. Okay, so that's uh, another experimental test. It's the oldest one, actually. Um, that it was known from the 19th century that if you look at the orbit of Mercury, it's not a perfect ellipse. Uh, in Newton's theory, as we will see, the orbits of the planets, uh, providing you treat the sun as a spherical object, the orbits, of, and you ignore the interactions between the planets, then the orbit of an object around the sun would be periodic. It's a fundamental prediction of Newton's theory, that the orbit is an ellipse, and the motion is exactly periodic. Okay? That's essentially because it's an integrable system. Um, and uh, in an integrable system, you have this uh, periodicity. But Einstein realized that his equations changed that prediction a little bit. So that the orbit of a planet is not exactly periodic, that it precesses. The ellipse will precess uh, slowly around the sun, and that's called a perihelion shift. Now, obviously, Mercury is closest to the sun. The gravitational field is largest, so you should expect the biggest effect there. And it just happened that in the 19th century, astronomers had been measuring the orbit of Mercury very, very accurately, and they'd noticed this anomaly. It's a tiny anomaly, okay? The anomaly is that the, that the orbit of Mercury precesses by 43 arc seconds, right? 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in a degree. So uh, 43 over 3,600 of a degree per century, <laughs> okay? There was this tiny anomaly that Mercury is just drifting around at 43 arc seconds per century. And so Einstein knew that. And uh, so when Schwarzschild came up with his metric, Einstein tried to work out, are orbits going to be periodic or not? And he went through the calculation, and as you will see, uh, absolutely miraculously, the prediction of GR is 43 arc seconds per century. <laughs> okay? So... How did they measure 43... It's the seconds per century, like... Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I can, I can just quote the numbers. Um, the, uh, so more, Mercury completes 415 orbits per year, per Earth year. Okay, so a lot of orbits. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, they, so in a century, there's 40,000 orbits. And uh, so, yeah, if you measure it, Every day, uh, you're, 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 you're roughly the orbit is one day, one Earth day. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of orbits in there. And um, they, they had measured it to about one arc second accuracy per century. The angle you're looking for is about a millionth of a radian per orbit. Okay. That's what you're looking for. So let us see how that works. That was, again, totally spectacular prediction. And you, it's impossible to imagine, really, how Einstein felt when he took the Schwarzschild metric and just worked out its consequences and got exactly the right number. I mean, uh, if that doesn't convince you, you're on the right track, you know, nothing will. So. So it's worth understanding. So this happened uh, I'm not sure the precise date, but it's going to be somewhere around 1917 using uh, Schwarzschild's metric. And uh, strangely enough, Einstein never got the Nobel Prize for general relativity. He got it for the photoelectric effect. And the reason is that people were still skeptical about this for a long time. Uh, as late as the 1960s, people were saying maybe this precession of Mercury was due to the fact that the sun is not perfectly spherically symmetric. And so if the sun is a kind of uh, 
squashed object, it will drag orbits near it around, and you know you could argue that maybe that was that was the explanation, but it was just a you know incredible coincidence that GR just gives the number bang on the nail without any free parameters. Yeah. We're going to study that. We're going to see right now why GR is different than Newton's theory. So we're going to study uh, orbits of a massive particle in the Schwarzschild metric. Um, okay, so now I'm, I'm bored with writing C and, uh, and G, and so I'm going to define uh, Rs as uh, 2Gm over C squared, and, uh, and I'm going to write, uh, I'm actually going to take um, C equals 1, and uh, I'll take units in which C equals 1, and then I'm going to write the short shelf metric as Rs over R dt squared 1 plus, sorry, 1 minus Rs over R inverse dr squared plus r squared d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. So that's our short shell metric. And uh, for a massive particle, um, we must have 1 minus rs over r uh, t dot squared, so let's define uh, dx mu d tau as uh, x mu dot, and we've got to have g mu nu x dot mu x dot nu equals minus 1, okay, because I'm using units where c is 1, and so let's just write that down. That's equal to plus 1 minus Rs over R inverse R dot squared plus R squared theta dot squared plus sine squared theta phi dot squared equals minus 1. So that's our first uh, equation for, um, for the four velocity of the particle. So that equation has to be satisfied. And uh, now we're going to use some symmetry. So spherical symmetry. Spherical symmetry means that um, that the metric is spherical, and this implies that um, uh, this implies that, or you may expect that the solution is going to be for this polar angle theta. Uh, that if I pick theta equals pi over two, the particle is just going to go around the equator. Okay. So theta equals pi over 2 uh, should be a solution. And you should expect that all other solutions are obtained just by rotating, uh, rotating that, uh, that orbit uh, using, uh, use, yeah, using rotations to, to obtain the orbit in any other direction. Um, so, um, if theta is pi over 2, we can drop the theta dot term. 
And now we can look for conserved quantities. So uh, uh, we've, as we discussed earlier, the metric is independent of t and phi. Okay, so the, the g mu nu there does not depend on t, nor does it depend on phi. Okay, it only depends on r and theta. So because of that, we expect conserved quantities. And uh, these will be, uh, so this is because of Noether. And those, as we discussed before, we're going to have g t mu x dot mu and uh, g phi mu x dot mu. So the momenta conjugate to the coordinate um, uh, t or phi should be uh, conserved. And so this leads us to define the first one is the energy. E, which is uh, 1 minus Rs over R T dot. Okay, because the, the metric is diagonal, so this term is GTT. So GTT times T dot is the first term, 1 minus Rs over R times T dot. This is conserved, and we should also have an angular momentum. Momentum. L, uh, J, and that is G phi phi times phi dot. But G phi phi is uh, R squared sine squared theta, and I pick theta equals pi over 2, so it's just R squared. So J is R squared phi dot. Okay, so these are conserved. So this is very nice because I have three equations now, and these equations turn out to be sufficient to solve the whole problem. So three equations for three unknowns. T dot, R dot, phi dot, and so we can solve. So this is often the case, that when you have symmetry, you don't need to solve the full equation. Okay, your first thought might be, oh, let me write down the geodesic equation for a particle in Schwarzschild. And that's fine, it's correct, but it's a second-order differential equation, it's uh, much harder to solve. So much easier is to write down all the conserved quantities, and uh, they turn out, in situations of symmetry, the conserved quantities are frequently enough to enable you to solve uh, everything. Yeah? Number of conserved quantities. Yeah, so then it should ensure that it's enough for the system to be completely linear. Yeah, so you need a certain number of them. Yeah. Um, It'll help, but not all the HGAs will be separable. So. That's right. Yeah. So the general statement is you need a number of conserved quantities equal to the number of uh, uh, the number of degrees of freedom if you're going to be able to solve just using the conserved quantities. Okay. And in this case, we have the symmetry conserved quantities, and we have this constraint: g mu nu x dot mu x dot mu is minus one. And that's enough, enough to solve. Of course, once you've got the solution, you can always go back and check it satisfies the geodesic equation. And uh, it is uh, guaranteed to do that. 
Right, so let us now solve. So the way we're going to solve is eliminating t dot and phi dot from that second line on the top uh, blackboard. So we get um, minus e squared. So we're going to eliminate t dot and phi dot using these uh, conserved uh, quantities. So this is 1 minus rs over r plus r dot squared over 1 minus rs over r plus j squared over r squared equals minus 1. And this is worth staring at a little bit, or reorganizing. So let's reorganizing, re reorganizing, reorganize it. So it's r dot squared plus some potential energy, which is a function of r, is equal to e squared minus 1, which is a constant. So that's a good thing to do, to reorganize the equation so it looks like kinetic energy plus potential energy is a constant because we have intuition for such a thing. Uh, if you think about a particle moving in some potential, it obeys this equation. In Newtonian mechanics, it obeys this equation. And we know what will happen is that the total energy, if I give you some potential, V of R, and I have my particle with a certain energy, I plot V of R, I plot the energy, and I know the particle is going to be moving along this line, and, uh, and the difference between the energy and the potential is the kinetic energy. Okay, so, and we know intuitively exactly what's going to happen. It's going to rattle backwards and forwards. So it's always a good idea to try and write a uh, differential equation in that form. It, it, it sort of, you can see at a glance all of the possible solutions. So V of R is this uh, potential. It's minus Rs over R. Let's see if we can see that. See, when I multiply this through here, I'm going to get a, uh, a minus 1, which I'll leave on the right-hand side, and I'm going to get a plus Rf, Rs over R, which I'll move to the left-hand side. This is just the usual Newtonian, Newtonian potential. Okay, minus gm over r. The next term I get is plus j squared over r squared. See where that came from? That was just here. And this is the usual uh, centri... Uh, what is it? The centripetal or centrifugal? Centripetal force. Okay, so when you do Newtonian dynamics, the angular... Uh, part of the motion gives you an effective potential, 1 over r squared. It's just saying it's very hard to go to r equals 0 if you've got some angular momentum. Uh, this is um, that's where it's com coming from. And uh, or also called the angular momentum barrier. Barrier. Uh, so that's the usual angular momentum barrier, nothing new so far. And then we have a final term, which is rsj squared over r cubed. And that came about when I multiplied this term into the denominator, and I got the minus jrs over r cubed. So that's the effect of potential. And here is the gr correction. And if you did put in uh, the c's, because rs goes like 1 over c squared, you see the gr correction is down by 1 over 1 over c squared. So it is small. Um, okay, so let's sketch that potential. Yeah. 
So at large r, it's minus 1 over r. And then as you come in, the 1 over r squared becomes important, so it becomes repulsive. And in Newton's theory, that's all you'd get. This guy would diverge. Okay, but in Einstein's theory, you get another minus 1 over r cubed, so it does that. And uh, so you're already seeing the black hole. That uh, if I live in this potential, and uh, so now we, we can study the orbits. The orbits are just the constant energy lines. So here's an orbit. I come in from infinity. I bounce off this angular momentum barrier, and I go out to infinity. I can sit down here and go back and forth between these two points. Uh, that would be an elliptical orbit in Newton's theory. An elliptical orbit is, is just an oscillation between some smallest radius and some biggest radius. This, of course, is a circular orbit where I stay at the same radius. Here's another circular orbit. Okay, so this is the... Uh, a circular orbit near to the black hole. So there are two circular orbits. Uh, this circular orbit's not stable, right? Uh, you can see that intuitively. Some deviation from the circular orbit is going to send me off to infinity. Uh, this is unstable. Circular orbit. This one is a stable circular orbit. Um, and then if I'm inside, I can't get out if my energy is too small, okay? But the sort of interesting, most interesting orbits are, I can just be sucked in to r equals zero. Uh, so this guy's going to fall into the black hole. And it appears that there is an orbit coming out of the black hole, okay, <laughs> from this picture. And it's only really by understanding the space-time properly that we'll realize what this guy represents. Coming out of the black hole is possible in a certain sense, uh, but we'll see that it's not a physical sense. Okay, but the, this summarizes all the possible orbits. And uh, so now let us work out... Um, let us work out this stable orbit. This is obviously uh, one of the most interesting things. Uh, there is a stable circular... Uh, orbit, and uh, to find it, we just set dvdr equals zero, and that's equal to rs over r squared minus 2j squared over r cubed plus 3rs j squared over r to the fourth, and that is just a quadratic equation in r, so you can solve it. And you find that r is equal to j squared over rs times uh, 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 minus 3 rs squared over j squared. And uh, the stable one is the plus sign. r stable is equal to j squared over rs, 1 plus square root, 1 minus 3 rs squared over j squared. So, uh, something funny happens uh, as compared to Newton's theory. Um, in Newton's theory, the shape of the potential is always like this, and so there's always a stable orbit in Newton's theory for any j. But in Einstein's theory... As, uh, as you decrease j, decrease j, there is an innermost stable circular orbit. And in the jargon, this is known as a ISCO. So Schwarzschild geometry has an innermost stable orbit. Things cannot orbit stably at any smaller radii. And you can see immediately uh, 
uh, where it is that uh, at j squared equals 3rs squared. And when j squared is 3rs squared, then the stable orbit stable is equal to 3rs. OK, so you've got your black hole. Imagine there's stuff going around it. The stuff going around it just cannot sit in a stable orbit, circular orbit uh, inside of six times, uh, sorry, three times the Schwarzschild shell radius, or 6 gm over rc squared. If you get beneath that, uh, you, um, you, you, there are no st stable circular orbits. So that's a uh, very interesting phenomenon as compared to Newton's uh, theory. And very Okay, so let me see. Uh, I'll give you a choice. I think I'll, I can do the perihelion shift in about 10 minutes, or we can do it on Monday. Monday? Sounds good. So we'll do the perihelion shift on Monday. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's just a little bit of algebra using uh, this, uh, this equation. Are there any, any questions? Yeah. So, the, what was the accuracy of the measurement? Say again? Like between Einstein's prediction and the actual measurement, what was that? OK, so the measurement was 43 arc seconds per century. OK, so basically the orbit does this, whoops, I draw it, is the focus of the ellipse, and it sort of does this. Okay, so the, uh, the line through the ellipse is rotating at uh, 43 uh, arc seconds per century, and the measurement uh, was um, plus or minus one arc second. And the prediction was, yeah, around 43. Was there any, uh, anyone ever try to take into account other um, influences? Or? Yeah, so that's what I was mentioning, is that some people thought this was because the sun isn't spherical. Even just other... Us pulling mercury. They're completely negligible. The mass of the sun totally dominates the solar system. Interactions between the planets are really, really tiny. So there was no, I think that was the most plausible explanation, is just that the sun isn't spherical. We, since we don't know what's inside the sun, who's to say there isn't a big dumbbell in there going like this? <laughs> okay, And this big dumbbell would not have a Newtonian 1 over r potential, you know, because it's not spherically symmetric. And so this would be interpreted as some kind of structure must be inside the sun. In Einstein's theory, a spherical sun is good enough to explain the whole thing. Yeah. Just another question on that uh, gravitational time dilation of the black holes. If I fall into a black hole and, uh, and I survive somehow, <laughs> um, on my, my clock, it, say it takes a few seconds or a few minutes or whatever, uh, and I think about uh, all my friends on the other side of the black hole, will they be infinitely old at that point? Yes. They would be infinitely old the moment you cross the horizon. How does formation of black holes even make sense? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting, and people are really struggling with the answers still. Um, 
I think I have a way of understanding it, but I haven't. Uh, it's not fleshed out, but uh, but it's pretty it, it, it's pretty bizarre. I mean, it, it, the resolution is quantum that the black holes are not classical. Classical black holes seem not to make sense. Okay. Okay. That that's my point of view. Many quantum many make more sense. <laughs> uh, I I believe quantum black holes could make sense. Yeah. Uh, people are struggling very hard to make them make sense, and so far failing. Um, so, um, yeah, so classically, when you fall into the black hole, you're totally disconnected from the outside world. You're in another piece of the universe which can never communicate with the rest of the universe. So the reason why that's so troubling is that the whole idea in quantum mechanics is that you have a space of states, and evolution is unitary. And the evolution mixes all of these states, but they all talk to each other. I mean, unless I, I might have some super selection sector that, that basically breaks the quantum system up into subsystems. But within, within a subsystem, everybody talks to everybody else. And that's the fundamental to quantum mechanics. It's unitary. It's complete. You cannot separate something off. You know, so for example, in a, quant in a classical system, if I have a potential like this, then the orbits here are disconnected. So they rattle around here forever, and they never talk to those guys. Um, quantum mechanically, it's impossible. Quantum mechanically, you have tunneling. And everything is connected to everything else. So that's, that's really the definition of a quantum theory, is that everything can explore any state, can explore all states, or can be connected to all possible states. Now, if you're telling me that a part of the universe can disconnect and never reconnect, that seems to be incompatible with quantum mechanics. People talk about this as information loss. Quantum mechanics, you never lose information. In uh, this picture, you would lose information forever. And so that seems to be fundamentally at odds with the principles of quantum mechanics. And therefore, you have to decide, well, how does quantum mechanics manage to recover this stuff. And uh, yeah, I think there is a way to understand that, but it has not been. Without imposing a lot of additional uh, esoteric structure? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I believe there is a way of doing it, but uh, it hasn't been done. So the current uh, sort of uh, ideas, uh, Jim, you may, uh, I don't know if you heard of Jim Bardeen. So he's one of the experts on black holes and quantum mechanics of black holes. He's the son of John Bardeen, who won two Nobel Prizes in physics, the only, only person who ever won two. He invented the transistor, and he described super, superconductivity. And both of his sons are physicists, and one is Jim Bardeen, and he was here. I'm not sure if he's still here, but he was here for a while. He gave a talk about the, what he believes is the most plausible scenario for black, hole, for black holes, quantum black holes. And um, basically, there are three options. <laughs> okay. One is that uh, you form this black hole, and it lasts forever, and it just remains disconnected. Okay. Uh, that's pretty bad. Uh, then he has another scenario where you form the black hole, and uh, it's a, yeah, and, um, and basically, at a certain time, uh, this black hole would, this object would explode, literally explode, and it's big. It's it's not when it's small. At a certain time, this object, while still, in fact, its mass, so it would radiate away half of its mass. When it's half of its original mass, it would explode. He doesn't have the physics to explain that, but okay. nevertheless, he takes this seriously. I don't find any of these scenarios plausible at all, okay? So, but he is the, like a leader in that field. I'm just giving you an example of the craziness that uh, people are forced into. So one is that it lasts forever disconnected. Classical picture. The second one is that it gets down to half of its mass and it explodes. For some reasons involving physics, nobody knows. Okay, that's not very good. The third scenario is that it forms, and when it reaches half of its uh, original size, it slowly decays rather than explodes. These are his three scenarios. Still and for reasons no one understands. For reasons nobody understands. 
So I could tell you what my opinion is, but I don't yet have calculations to back it up. But uh, I think there's an absolutely clear way to resolve these issues, and it's nothing to do with explosions. And yeah. Can't leave this hanging out <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, uh, I did write a paper uh, last December where I explained quantum tunneling in a new way. And uh, the way is that when, when something tunnels through a barrier, um, its coordinate, in a very definite sense, becomes a complex number, not a real number. Um, and so you can describe uh, quantum tunneling processes by saying that in quantum mechanics... You know, um, I'm trying to do a path integral. I find saddle points of the action. That when you find a saddle point, there is absolutely no reason why a saddle point... saddle point is a solution of the classical equations. Delta S, delta phi is zero. In quantum mechanics, there's absolutely no reason why that solution should be real. It can be complex. And the explanation for quantum tunneling that I gave is that if you look in the... If this is x, v of x you have to look in the complex plane. And so whereas classically a particle cannot go through a barrier, quantum mechanically it turns out there are solutions which do this, and they just go nicely around the barrier in the complex plane. And then you say, what the hell does that mean if X is complex? But actually there's a way of measuring it. So there is a way of measuring the imaginary part of this coordinate as it is tunneling. And in fact, we are on the threshold of technologies which will enable us to measure that. So now you say, what about the black hole? Well, the black hole is just uh, evaporation, is quantum tunneling. Classically, stuff goes in, it makes the black hole, it never comes out. Quantum mechanically, it has to come out through Hawking radiation. And so what you have is some incoming state. You've got some outgoing state, which is the Hawking radiation with no black hole. The task is to find the solution of the Einstein equations that collect, connects the two. It's a saddle point. It will be complex. It will not have a Schwarzschild horizon because the whole thing, geometry is complex. And all of the debates people are having are totally beside the point. That's, that's my, my view. And that, that uh, it may be that all the ingredients for solving the problem are in Einstein's equations, but you've got to find some non-trivial solutions of those equations. Nobody's even tried. So that's, uh, that's, that's my view. The, the converse is, is also true. If there is no solution, if there's no classical solution satisfying the appropriate boundary conditions, then we will never understand black hole evaporation uh, until we ha go beyond semi-classical. So then if there's no such solution, you're doomed until you have a theory of quantum gravity. But all the discussions people are currently having are completely besides the point. That's my humble view. <laughs> Any other questions? And so far, nobody's disagreed with me. <laughs> okay, so. But uh, they, they, they're still very busy making these funny scenarios with uh, putative in explosions driven by quantum effects and so on. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still wondering about the, um, this extra time. Yes. Yeah, because in, in, in proceeding to get here, we made some symmetry, and, as I, and we took some symmetries of the GR theory yeah. that seemed to make it as close to Newton's theory, as we can go. No, no, no the symmetry way. was just spherical symmetry, so we didn't say it was close to Newton. No. Okay. It was a physical assumption that the star was spherical. So then, like, what, what accounts for the difference between the two predictions? I mean, we can go from the metric and come here. Yes. But what can we say about why there's an extra term? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, what's the sort of fundamental origin of that term? I mean, it follows from the assumptions. <laughs> uh, if you want to somehow get some insight into why we got that extra term, I'm not sure I can give it without thinking more. 
um, you know, basically it happened because I multiplied through by this <laughs> 1 minus rs over r. So in Newton, maybe one way of saying it is the following. Yeah, I mean, it's coming from the gravit... No, that's not the gravitational... It's coming from this term. Imagine I didn't have that denominator and I multiplied through. Then I would only get Newton. So it clearly comes from here. It comes from this term in the metric, the dr squared term. Okay? This, this, is the, this is the gravitational potential term. It's really the same as Newton, but this is the other term. So somehow in, in, in Newtonian theory, you don't have a correction to dr squared. You could say Newtonian theory is just like Einstein, but without a correction to dr squared. Uh, <clears throat> it's sort of, uh, yeah, space would be just flat space. Space is not being bent by gravity. So in Einstein's theory, space is being distorted by gravity. Uh, and that's responsible by this, uh, for this term. As I mentioned, when Einstein did his first calculation of the deflection of light, he only knew about the first term, the 1 minus rs over r, because he didn't have the field equations. <laughs> so he didn't know that there would be a coefficient of dr squared, and he just neglected it. And that's why he got the deflection angle of light wrong by a factor of two. He just ignored that. He didn't know about the other term. Um, and uh, so his first prediction was that the deflection angle was a half of the correct one. Uh, then he got the field equations, and he realized, whoops, there's a correction to the metric. And uh, then it gave the perihelion shift and the deflection of light. So, but yeah, it's coming from the distortion of space. I mean, I think that's the uh, best explanation I can give. In Newton's theory, space is absolute, and then you have this force acting in space, right? Nothing bends space in Newton's theory. It's always flat. But in Einstein's theory, the whole of space bends. Any other uh, questions? No? Okay, great. So